So glad we have more faces in the room. <laughs> um, welcome to our intergenerational dialogue about defining success. I am Dr. Nisha Gupta. I am a clinical psychologist and a psychology professor at the University of West Georgia. And this is my first time at the Festival of India, and I'm just blown away by the incredible power that exists in this convention center today. Um, I think the Indian American community has so much power, so much vibrancy, and you could, of course, argue so much success. And what do we mean by success? That's what we're going to be talking about today. One definition that I'll throw out there is that uh, success is the result of devoting our hearts and minds towards a vision and then finding the resources and the support to bring that vision to life. So this very event is one example of a person's beautiful vision uh, that has come to life successfully and we're all uh, benefiting from it as a community. Um, but why are we hosting this dialogue about success today at the Festival of India? Uh, because Indian immigrants and Indian Americans are often given the label of the model minority and headlines across U.S. media speak to our success at the top of tech, medicine, entrepreneurship, education, etc. Um, this is something to be incredibly proud of. There is a beautiful sense of empowerment that comes from this, which fuels us to thrive across the generations as a community. But on the flip side, we are all well aware of, of the shadows that come with that as well. There can be a lot of pressure and even mental health suffering uh, that can accompany these expectations of success across the generations. I worked as a therapist uh, for college counseling centers for eight years, and I was struck by this very tension that Indian American college students in particular would come to therapy with um, in trying to create a successful life for themselves their mental health journeys were filled with moments of exhilaration, accomplishment and pride alongside frustration, fear, and shame. And so this is the tension that all of us are probably familiar with in this room, no matter our age. Um, both the light and the shadows of trying to create a successful life for ourselves, our families, our community. So today we want to open that up for conversation. Um, we have a wonderful group of panelists um, of all different generations who will be sharing their insights and their journeys about uh, what success means to them and what living a successful life means. We're also going to invite audience participation. I have a list of questions that I'll be asking um, and you know the panelists will respond first but we'll open it up and if anybody else wants to share throughout the dialogue we really welcome um, conversations and the goal is by the end of this conversation we, we all just leave with a deeper understanding of how to keep co-creating a vision of success for our community that is holistic, healing, and empowering for every generation, okay? Um, so I said I have a list of questions and I wanna, I wanna start off by just inviting our, our formal panelists here to kind of raise their hands, introduce themselves, and when you're introducing yourself, please um, do so in a way that, you know, introduce who you are, in a way that you most want people to remember you when you leave this earth. That is the prompt for you. And I will just, anybody go for it. Hey, uh, my name is Jyotsna, Jyotsna Hendi. Uh, professionally, uh, you know, uh, I have an IT background, uh, but I have also uh, sort of forayed into um, other uh, fields as well. And um, the thing about, um, we, uh, well, family-wise, I have a daughter, young daughter, who was born 17 years after marriage, and which is very precious to uh, my husband and I. And so, you know, as I pursue my IT interests, uh, I also uh, decided that uh, reading and writing is something that I really uh, sort of, you know, um, I'm passionate about. Uh, I'm an avid reader, I have been, uh, but I discovered that writing was also one of my passions. So I kind of uh, forayed into that field. I do reviews, I interview people. Um, that's uh, sort of what I do. Uh, but I think um, in doing all of that and in what life itself offered to me, um, and the, I have sort of been one of these people that has learned the hard way uh, that it, it's something that this panel is all about, about success and how it needs to be defined 
only by you, you know, it's, it's just that. It's, uh, no one else can do it for you and you should never ever give the power to somebody else to define it for you. It is meant to be something that you have to be able to define for yourself. So, and hopefully, uh, you know, I have been doing that and um, I hope people remember me as the person who was compassionate, who was kind when they needed them, what needed for them to be and uh, unknowingly uh, not hurt anyone. Um, you know, that's all I want to be remembered as. Right. Thanks, Jessica. <clears throat> Y'all hear me? Is it better like that? I no, hear it. Mic's, oh, mic's better. All right, my name's Veshi Shi Jajam. Uh, I'm your typical, stereotypical IT industry person. I've been an IT manager for some time now. I've uh, been in the industry for very long. Uh, but what I come here today is more with a parent perspective. I have to struggle with my parent and with my child. So that's what I wanted to talk today. And you said, well, how do I want to be remembered as? My other life or my other personality is I think I'm an activist. Uh, I have always constantly engaged with social justice causes. <clears throat> and I want to be remembered as someone who kind of steered the needle just a little bit towards uh, social justice, towards an equitable society. Uh, that's what I want, you know, no matter what the cause is, as long as it, we bend the arc towards the social justice, we lift, uplift the society, I think that's the direction we, I should go and I should take people along. That's about me. Thank you. Hello, I'm Sanria Nath. I'm 16 years old and I go to Wheeler High School. I'm a rising junior. And, I mean, from a school standpoint, I'm the president of Model UN and Wheeler Community Music Outreach. I'm on the varsity tennis team, but I really like the question, like, what do I most want to be remembered for? I want to be remembered for my singing. I've been singing on stage since I was three years old, and I can sing in six languages. And I won the Chicago Indian Icon when I was seven years old. And from then, I've been constantly singing on any stage that I can be singing. And I've sung at state level swim competitions at Georgia Tech at um, Tower of Talent in many competitions. And singing is just my biggest passion. And where I am now, I release my own music on Spotify, Apple Music, I, um, Amazon Music. And I just hope that I can leave my mark as an Indian singer in this day and age. Yeah. Hi. Uh, my name is Amit Arora, but before I start, I want to uh, you know, talk about a barometer which we all take, and that is money. So I want to ask the audience, how many rich people do you remember from 17th or 18th century? Anyone? Do you remember any rich people in 17th, 18th century? Do you remember, do you remember the scientists in the 17th and 18th century? Some of them. Yeah, so you do. So my main uh, point over here is one of the parameters that we talk about is money. Money is... Uh, uh, you know, you'll never be remembered by how much but, money you earn. Yeah, very right? nice. So that's my bit. So uh, again, my name is Amit Arora, and uh, I'm uh, I'm a graduate of IIT, uh, ITBHU. I came here in 1989 and have been working in IT industry ever since. I'm in the management of my company, Technicolor. Uh, but my passion is different. My passion is organizing. So I have been organizing ever since. Uh, when I came to this country, I became uh, part of India Student President of India Student Association uh, in the Student Program Board. When I went to Peoria, I became uh, President of uh, India Association of Peoria, and uh, then I went to the Board of Pan IIT USA. And but those are just titles, right? But over there, I have sincerely, sincerely tried to make a difference. And that is my passion. My passion is to try to make a difference in people, and that's hopefully people will remember me by that. <clears throat> hey guys, my name is Archit. Thank you all so much for having me here. I really appreciate it, and thank you all for being here. Um, I want to say for me, the one word that always comes to mind is storytelling. And that is my passion. I love helping people communicate and being able to communicate. And I think that's one of the most important things, because you might not be able to solve everybody's problems, but we can listen and understand and that makes us more empathetic and a better human being. Because there is really no right or wrong, so I am an engineer turned journalist, so much to my parents' dismay, I went to Georgia Tech, got my master's in engineering, and told them I'm not going to go be an engineer. And they were like, oh my God, what do we tell everyone? So, which is totally fine. I mean, now they're like, I was like, listen, if we need more people to be Sanjay Guptas and Fareed Zakarias and people with representation and diversity. And uh, I am a journalist. I work for uh, a, a reporter by day. And outside of 
the world of news, I think a lot of the things that I enjoy doing also naturally gravitate towards storytelling. Uh, I teach yoga and I perform improv and all of that, there's a common thread of listening to the world and understanding and reacting. And uh, most recently, and I shared this with the panelists earlier during the pandemic, um, I'm in my 30s and I came out publicly as a gay Indian American. And that is certainly difficult in the Indian American culture. Everybody wants, when are you getting married? And asking all these questions. And I said, no, I still hope to get married when I find the right person. But not being married and not being what society expects you to be isn't a failure. I think being who you are and owning who you are and communicating your own story is so important. Because if you don't tell your own story, somebody else will tell it for you. And so that's why I think, I want to leave you guys with a quote because I love little quotes. So this says, all it takes is one special person to take a chance on you and change your life. All it takes is one special day for it to all happen, for new opportunities and new experiences. This person will push you and motivate you and inspire you and challenge you for that better. And that person is you. So you have the mic in your hand, just like I do. So feel free to rewrite your own story. And you can't go back and fix what happened, but you can change, start now and change the ending. So I hope you all are inspired by everybody here. and Just live a life that is true and authentic to yourself. Hi everyone, my name is Anand. Um, I'm a rising junior at um, Harvard College. I came to this country um, in April of 2002 when I was born um, in Marietta, Georgia. So I've always been here. Um, so, uh, <laughs> along, with, along with my friend here, I am also a member of the you know, youngest generation of, of um, Indian Americans. Um, and so, uh, a little bit about me is I'm, you know, I kind of fell into the classic. Um, Indian stereotype trend that we kind of look for. You know, I'm Indian. I'm pre-med. I want to be a neurosurgeon. You know, um, I you know go to Harvard for whatever that is that is worth. Um, but I think that it's important to. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I dance Bharatanatyam um, with. Uh, my... oh, yeah. Thank you. So I think the what I want to leave from this from this earth from for people to remember about me is kind of breaking stereotypes i want to be you know a, a man who who is you know <clears throat> straight but also enjoys bharatanatyam dancing and has it as a strong passion um you know a a high achieving college student and a pre-med and, and a neurosurgeon who's not you know egotistical and shuts everybody down but that people remember for being the one that is kind um, you know, not the stereotypical academic person, that's why I chose art history as my minor. And why my parents are, are, you know, very, very happy that I did that, is that, you know, all of this allows me to kind of break free from, I guess, the path that I've fallen into that we generally prescribe for who we are as Indians. And I think that that is what is really most important to me. I think in terms, like, uh, by Shishi, I'm also very interested in health policy, which I think that that is one of the prevalent things, prevalent problems that we have in the U.S. now. I think especially, again, um, among Indian Americans and other underserved minorities. So I think that that is, um, you know, kind of what I want to focus on in this world and try to make it a more kind, accepting, diverse place because I think that's really where we as a society as a whole, not even as Indian Americans, as Indian Americans living in the U.S. among so many other cultures will succeed. We have a fuller house now, so if you want to get closer to the thank stage. You, thank you, Nisha. Um, I'm, I'm flabbergasted. The, the talent, the uh, articulateness, the uh, knowing what you want out of these guys is amazing. Um, Jotska, I've known you for many years. Your creativity, your, you're just rock. I, I've, I've followed you for many, many years, and I'm so glad you're giving, uh, continue to give your time to the uh, India Association. Uh, myself, personally, I'm kind of stuck. Stuck with a female name. <laughs> My first name is Priya, P-R-I-Y-A. The reason it makes sense is my parents named me Priya Ranjan Mishra. And of course it gets too long, the middle name Ranjan, who, whoever wants it. Anyway, that's my name. Um, I'm not nearly as um, successful in life as you guys are. 
I mean, honestly, I'm not being uh, self-deprecating. I'm telling you the truth. Um, my uh, biggest success, and one that I hope people will remember me by, is friends and family who carry me, hopefully, in their heart. Because there's just no doubt in my mind that we become a little bit of the people we like and the people who like us. It helps us, it, you cannot deny it, we become that. Beginning with our parents, when they pass away, you act like them, you carry their banner, you carry their style. You cannot escape your lineage, you cannot escape your genes. So, kind of a bit of a background, I, I don't think it's that relevant, but I came to this country when I was 17. I came right after high school in India, I guess we call it intermediate. And uh, <clears throat> making a, a rather long story short, I came here in 64, uh, came from Western UP, and as some of you know, Western UP is kind of dry and deserted. And I landed in North Carolina, in Western North Carolina, September 24th. Couldn't believe the color of the leaves, how beautiful the, the, the ecology was. Uh, went to a junior college for two years and uh, then transferred to uh, Tennessee Tech <coughs> where I got my engineering degree. Another engineer. <laughs> um, somebody dropped something here, spotting me. Is that, is that credit card? No, no. What is that? Okay. Um, so, my, uh, at age 75, I don't really work. I work at, uh, uh, going broke slowly, uh, <laughs> but uh, enough to live on. Three children, one is a, uh, the older one is a uh, senior scientist with Mark in Boston. Uh, the middle child <clears throat> is a uh, well-traveled, well-educated international business guy, and uh, he lives here in Marietta. And then my youngest, who arrived uh, 14 years after the middle one, uh, is my pride and joy. She's uh, 38, she's an attorney downtown. All of these kids have gotten the finest educations. Dartmouth, the, uh, Oxford, the attorney I told you about, she, she got, last two years she's been in Oxford. So, as an accomplishment, I haven't done hardly anything, but uh, I'm totally, totally proud of having raised good children who will continue to uh, change the world for the better. Um, as the intro, that's all I want to say at the moment. Thank you so much to all of the panelists for introducing themselves so beautifully. And I'll also answer that just very briefly, that um, I think what I want to most be known for when I leave the world is um, very much the value of kindness, but also helping people love themselves exactly as they are. Most of my work as a therapist in the past has been about um, working with uh, members of the LGBTQ community, uh, queer people of color, and people that have been marginalized. And um, so self-love and, and making sure people feel that sense of belonging and acceptance is, is the values that I most want to leave behind. Um, and part of me doing this as well, you know, because our journeys uh, have been complex, all of us in this room. So I'm going to go into the first question for the panelists, and because we have a, a bit more people here, we're just going to stick to the panelists at first, then we're going to open it up for conversation afterwards. Um, first, I want to ask the panelists, have you experienced a moment in your life which transformed the way that you understand what success really means to you? And if so, please describe that experience and what you learned from it. And I'm going to actually give the mic to Ali. So, uh, I'm not sure if a lot of you know, but I have uh, many brushes with death. Uh, 
May 30th, uh, 2015, a tree struck my car. I didn't strike the tree. The tree fell on my car. And it was a Nissan Leaf. And the joke was, the tree doesn't fall far from the leaf. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but I had a few more brushes with that. I had three heart attacks. Uh, and I have autoimmune disease, which my doctor said, you may live for three months or may live for 30 years. And uh, I, I think at that point, you start looking into what is on your tombstone, how people remember, remember you. And that, those moments actually do change your perspective of life. Uh, I'm not saying, it's saying that you change uh, drastically, but I mean, you have to go to office and you have to still work. But those moments do change to the fact that, hey, now you want people to, you, you, you try to understand what is more important thing. And that is actually very true in today's day. After COVID, we have seen that people have changed. Money is not the main, main criteria for happiness anymore. It's friends and family. So that brush with them or the, does change you, and that did change me. Uh, another thing that I want to tell you about is uh, my personal demons. Which means I, I uh, struggled with depression for a very, very, very long time. I mean, every summer I was, uh, uh, there are times when I wanted to kill myself. Uh, there are times, uh, and my friends, and not my friends, but my family was behind me. Uh, and every summer I would just have a depression for no reason. I mean, there would be a trigger. And 2002, I went to a psychologist, uh, psychiatrist and we talked about it and uh, I think I have been much, much better after that. I have not had any episodes. So I think one of the major successes personally that I've seen is uh, coming, fighting my battle, my, my demons and coming, uh, coming out as victorious. Uh, Sanjay, thank you for being so brave and sharing so much. That's beautiful. That's Give him a huge round of applause for being so vulnerable. Thank you. And I'm just going to add to that really quickly if I can, because I actually have to go to another panel. <laughs> Same thing was what you said is I think it's sometimes when it's a, like a, almost a death-defying moment. Like my mom, luckily, is okay. She is a three-time cancer survivor. She went through breast cancer and thyroid cancer, and she's fine. But every six months when you go for that checkup, it's always like, oh, is it going to be fine? It's, like, it's always there in the back of your mind. But I think it's so funny how a, a pandemic or a cancer diagnosis, and luckily she's great, she has a great attitude, and she is a survivor. So I think getting diagnosed with something also doesn't mean it's a death certificate. I think it's a wake-up call to how should you live, as you said, right? This, all of our timelines at some point is going to run out, and it's being healthy, moving, and exercising, and all those things that we hear about and read about. But I think it's also, going back to quotes, I love quotes, if you want something different, you have to do something different. So for my mom's case, right, even my, my dad, like, they're, they're fine, they're, they're great, but it's also, how are you changing your diet? How are you changing your health? And not just worrying about a certification or someone saying that, my dad would be like, oh, I don't need to look like this. Like, it's not about looking like this or that, but as Indian or Indian Americans, we have a lot of great things, Ayurveda things that are already built in our culture with so many beautiful properties like turmeric and coconut oil and things and why do we have to wait till the western like america says oh wow this is great and then go back so appreciating our own culture and tradition but also just doing what sense for you what makes sense for you in your life and and again not really worrying about what people think i think for me that's the biggest level of like just do what makes you happy as long as you're not hurting someone or harming someone if you want to go on a trip go do it if you want to learn classical dance, go do it. Do what makes you happy because that's you. Because you only get to live your own life. And I think for me that was a big revelation the last few years and doing the career I love and speaking truthfully and being honest. I think when you have that, you just are more happy and you're able to spread that with other people. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it's really beautiful, both of you sharing. Uh, you know, what I hear you saying is that you've had moments of, you know, brushes with death, frankly. You know, there are moments in our lives where we wake up to what's actually important and what our values are. Um, and I hear for, for, in both those responses, health. You know, we chase after certain visions of, of success, but we then we are faced with something very serious and we understand what it means to actually prioritize our health as 
the most important part of success, and that's both physical and mental health. Um, and sometimes that involves uh, facing our demons uh, and having the courage to do that. And it also sometimes involves not caring what other people think, which is hard. It's a hard thing to do. Um, but hopefully we can find communities and people that support us through that. So thank you so much for both of those. Yeah. The second question I have is, have you experienced a time in your life when you couldn't live up to societal or cultural expectations of success? If so, how did you cope with that struggle? And what lessons did you learn about the meanings of success and failure from this experience? And you have something actually. Thank you, Alicia. You know, I uh, have a bachelor's degree in engineering. Thank you, Alicia. And a master's in computer science, right? So, um, and then um, I was all set. And, you know, um, I got married very early because that's the way it worked in India, you know. Um, in fact, I had not even met my husband when the horoscope, somebody's uncle gave my dad the horoscope. So it matched. And then they said, hey, everything's great. You have finished your engineering, so you can marry, you know, the boys in America. So, okay. Um, so he landed, and then I had not met him. I had spoken to him over the phone, but then, you know, marriage happened, and I came here. Uh, that was the first time at the wedding hall is when I met him. So, um, and then I came here, I, you know, everything was going according to plan in the, by the Indian standards. So of course, I did my master's, and then for, uh, I got a job, and I was also uh, teaching at a university um, at that point of time. So, here I am, and then of course I read, uh, I got a, I got admitted into, I got admission into um, a, for a PhD also. So here I am, uh, pretty much everything all settled by, and quote unquote successful by all Indian standards. And then, um, but then it had been almost five, close to five, six years since I was married, and um, as it turned out, we had no kids. And, um, well, I did have a few miscarriages, but then we did not have kids. So, so uh, when I met people, nobody talked about, you know, what I was doing professionally or what I had done. Uh, I, I, was, I came from a very, um, from a family where I didn't even know how to cook. So, I, you know, everything had been, uh, when I cooked for the first time, and it, um, it was very bad a few years, but then, even though small things were meant success to me, but I was not able to celebrate anything because everywhere I went, people would say, hey, oh, you don't have a kid yet. Oh, what happened? I heard about the miscap. Uh, they won't talk because that's taboo. They won't even sympathize, which makes it you know, even more sadder because they're saying, oh, I'm so sad for you, but they're not saying why because it's taboo to talk about it. So. Uh, it, it, it's very, you know, it's uh, it's a lot of pressure. So, uh, and then I started to not, under, and then I had this huge. Uh, then we went through a lot of procedures like IVF, which is also physically and mentally very draining. I went through three of them, and you know we had all these frozen transfers. So in all, I have about eight miscarriages, and every single time it is painful. You know, you, you go through a series of emotions, um, and then uh, you know. Then what do you get out of it? So, but you're sad, and the only thing society and you have all this success to your credit. But when you try to be happy about something, when you want to travel, people are like, oh, you travel. Oh, is it because you're sad? No, it's because I want to travel. So there is that thing, you know, they, the, that thing about success or how you should be even happy for that matter. People are even surprised. You can be happy when something like that hits you. Uh, you know, it's, um, and then, yeah, like Ahmed um, and uh, Archit's mom, um, something went wrong with the IVF the last time, and the doctors uh, at Emory said, um, you know, we are not able to find the baby that they implanted in there, so we don't know where it is, so we have to just go in there. It might be in your uterus, it might be in your kidney or your liver. We don't know at this point because none of the ultrasounds could find it. So we said, as they said, if the baby bursts, then you'll die on the table because we, uh, we can't do anything, we don't know where it is. So, at that point of time, I, I, I decided, I, I said to myself, okay, so I've had all of this, and I'm letting all these people tell me how to be happy or even successful. And, you know, I gave up. And after that, I never thought about, and somehow that, you know, that surgery was successful and I came out of it okay. 
After that, I decided that I'm going to define success for myself. What it is to be happy, what it is to be compassionate, because, you know, there's so much lack of compassion in the world today. You know, when I see people, it's like nobody really sympathizes. It's just you're being, uh, I, I don't know what it is, but the lack of compassion is just uh, overwhelming to me. And it, it's required, you know, it's, it, it, it's what runs the world really when you see another person and you just sit with them. You don't say anything, you just share your sorrow or joy, whatever it is. Um, anyway, so that's, those are the things I decided to build upon and you know, that's when I shifted over to writing to transfer sort of whatever I felt to, uh, to give it like a creative outlet basically, you know. So, and writing helped me do that and my husband, you know, I really have to give him credit because uh, he really helped me through that whole process um, and uh, you know, and three years after that surgery, uh, there was literally 0.01% chance, the doctor said, of me having a child. And here I am, 0.01%. So, yeah, and then, you know, that's when I said, hey, you know, this is, it was meant to be, or, you know, whatever it is, destiny. See, the thing is, you can work hard all your life, right? But then, Hard work and destiny have to meet and that's when success really happens. Sometimes people work all their lives and somehow I feel destiny plays a role because if it was not meant to be, because I, I went to all of the top most doctors in this world, in this country. I went to Fairfax, Virginia, I went to Emory and I went to Johns Hopkins in Baltimore. These are like the top most uh, you know, medical universities. None of the doctors could do anything and this is uh, not to disclose everything, but apparently we had no issues, no problems, medical problems. They never understood why I had all these miscarriages. So whereas destiny has to be, it played a role, you know. And you know, that's, that's when I, I said, okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going to spend more time with cultural, uh, not cultural organization, non-profit, you know, it's not just money. Like Amit said, you know, money is, uh, to be happy, to be, you know, currency has to not come from notes, it has to come from your heart. That's where the, where the real currency and happiness comes from. To be successful, you have to be peaceful, you know, and uh, to be successful is to be peaceful with what and who you are. To be successful is to be compassionate to another person. To be successful is to simply align, you know, yourself with the way you live to the way you think, you know, that to me, um, I, I redefine success for myself and I'm not going to let anybody else tell me otherwise. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing that. I'm struck by uh, um, your journey and, and how uh, honest and candid you are about the, the realities of your journey and it makes me think, you know, it's so incredible and we've applauded for you and being able to have a child, but also everything that you've been through has also contributed to a different kind of success, which to me is a spiritual success, which is a deepening of your character and your, your, the deepening of your heart to be more and more compassionate through the struggles that you've been through. And so there's something that really comes, uh, that is that we gain some wealth through the times that maybe we can't live up to uh, what society is telling us we should be too. So I think that's really beautiful. And Anand, I want to give the mic to you as well to answer that question. Oh. Yeah, great. Yeah, thank you. Oh. Are we good? We're good. So I, I thought long and hard about this question um, because I have been part of very few people in the Indian American community, especially my generation, to never face that sort of social or cultural explicit um, pressure to succeed. Because, you know, whether it's through um, my parents or the people around me, I've been very privileged to always fit that cookie cutter definition of success. So I had to figure out where I'm still feeling this pressure from, where I'm still, you know, kind of, kind of struggling from. And I think what that creates is intrinsic to all of us. There is, especially for, I guess, the generations that, that go through this, um, it creates a sort of perfectionist complex in us, where once you've achieved something, and then you achieve the next thing, 
you create the sort of sense of self that I am the achiever, I have to be perfect in everything, or I am a failure. It creates a sort of binary that you never kind of come down from. And I think the most that I struggled with that is going into college, and I'm sure some of the other panelists can, can think about that. You know, I was always the, um, the achiever throughout my childhood. And then, you know, you, you get to college, and these are your friends who are, you know, one weekend they say, hey, I'm giving a speech. It's a speech to the UN, and Coffee Annan invited them personally. Or, you know, there's um, one of my other friends who keeps publishing articles and research in Smithsonian, in Time, in Washington Post, in New York Times, everything. And it gets really hard then to continue keeping on your sense of self, because no longer are you the one. No longer are you the most successful one. And I think what I did to kind of get over that um, is I had life hit me a little bit. Um, um, kind of similar to uh, Amit here, I have also had like near-death experiences, but not as of myself, you know, nearly dying. Um, I worked as a nursing assistant in Kennestone in the neurological ICU. And you know, there's a lot of stories that I have from there, and there's a lot that's you know, protected by HIPAA, but you know, I, I, think, I think every other day I used to come home um, in the morning, like 7 a.m., and just sit down and cry for about 30 minutes. I think one story that I can't share, and one that really, really affected me, was um, there was a young man about my age who was in a motorcycle accident, and he'd never wake up from that. You know, there were five tubes all over his body. His mom and his dad were divorced. His dad flew in from you know wherever he was from, and they'd been divorced, fighting for like five years. But for five hours, I sat at their bedside and listened to them talk about their son, about the life that they created together for him. And they showed me pictures and memories and videos and his friends. And how do you face that realization that, you know, their son's life is going to end? It's not going to come back. What are my struggles of self when this is life for a lot of people? Um, so I think that having that sort of experience where that really is the thing that matters is the people you leave behind, what you achieve, your memories and your friends and your dreams and hopes and aspirations, your pictures, your videos, that's what really matters. So I think that created kind of a mindset switch in me to say, don't feel intimidated by your friends who are speaking at the UN or publishing all of these papers. It's not a thing to be scared of or pressured by. That's a thing to you know, take inspiration from and be better. And you know, I'm not saying that um, you know, I'm perfect or I have everything figured it out because you know, I opened LinkedIn this morning and he published another article and you know, my, my mood just you know, dropped like a sack of bricks. Because you know, that's the thing. So I think there's this thing of when you reach the top, wherever your success is, um, there's kind of a cultural thing that we have of you know, apart from you know, getting into a good college or getting a good job or something like that, how much further can you go or do you have to go to keep society thinking that you're the best? And I think that there is no concrete answer to that and just you know, racking your head about it, me thinking all the time, what are med schools going to think about what I want to do is just, you know, um, in the chemical locha that will fry your brain from the inside out and not make you be able to enjoy anything or achieve anything. So I think that that kind of mindset shift, that implicit sociocultural um, expectation that no matter what we do, even as attitudes are changing, even if you don't have to go to Columbia or Oxford or, or Harvard to be you know, successful in our community, um, not pushing yourself and creating this perfectionist image of yourself is definitely a really hard thing that we have to get through. Thank you so much for that, Alan. I wanted to ask you this in particular because my little brother is also a Harvard doctor. And I would have asked him that if he was here with us today. And I think that you're speaking to something so important, which is that even when you are doing everything to kind of live up to those uh, cultural societal expectations of success and your, you know, your, your parents' pride and joy with it and everything, that actually also can become a trap. 
um, that we can feel the weight or the pressure of having to always live up to that picture of success and, and um, you know, allowing ourselves and the people we love to be human too <laughs> is kind of what, what I hear you saying or, you know, allow, we, uh, none of us, I think none of us can, can be like that for our whole lives. We all deserve times to be tired, to do nothing, to rest, um, and then keep striving, you know, uh, if, if we want. And so I think you're speaking to that, and I'm also hearing you speak to a value shift that in, in pursuing your passion, which is medicine, you're also, um, you are thinking about life and death questions and wondering, at the end of the day, do, do you need to have a more, like, ego needs fulfilled, which is showing I'm the best, or do you, you know, want to commit to your passions, but also uh, value the people in your life? That's really what I heard you saying in that that anecdote, and I think that's really beautiful that that's already been happening for you this early in your medical career. Yeah. Yeah, I think there is. Sorry, just one, mm -hmm. you know, really quick thing. Um, I think also that creates, you know, a kind of pressure for your loved ones and your friends, as you say. I have a sister who's now in ninth grade. <laughs> And I really, really, I, you know, sometimes I, I worry about her. Um, not for, not because, you know, she's weird as all. You know, 14 year olds are 14 year olds. We all know it, we all went through it. You know, we can look back and say, you know, I had angst, like, God, why was I like that? But there's a lot of things that she feels herself that she has to live up to being my sister. And, you know, um, it's not fair to her to have that, you know, put on her. Um, societally and my parents have never forced that onto her but you know when we talk she still feels that that she has to you know she's going through the same high school I did with my same teachers and is known right now as my little sister you know so it's it's really hard for her to break away from that and try to be her own person and I think that that's something that you know is changing slowly and I hope continues to thank you for that so this is some little sibling hazing going on here <laughs> since Akash isn't here with us today. <laughs> Priya, do you also want to share about a time where you have struggled in your success journey? We want to give the mic to you. Well, thank you, thank you, Nisha. Um, Nisha, you, you said something very important in the first minute, and that is uh, you referred to love and kindness. And let me tell you guys, I'm, like I said, I'm 75 years old, and I've been reasonably successful by some yardsticks. Um, and yes, people work very hard to put their kids to the best schools in hopes they'll end up at Harvard or Emory or a good medical school. And uh, then uh, the kids work very hard with their grind of life, especially if they go into medicine. I mean, medicine is a sacrifice. It tires me to think you guys put 23 hours at work every day sometimes, you know. But you do this, you do this for the cause. You do this because that's what you were felt to be destined with. But getting back to what Nisha said, I have uh, traveled a lot. I've been around some very successful people. I have read a lot. And uh, when I talk to my grandchildren, I tell them in very simple terms what is important to success. And some of those things are nitty gritty. Like I tell them, guys, you'll come across some things that are distasteful to do. You look at a to-do to -do list for the day and you avoid certain things. Don't do that, attack them. Do the most distasteful thing quickly, early, and you'll realize it was easy. Number two, I try to tell them, please, please, make about six good friends. Keep them from high school all the way to college and the rest of your life. You'll be glad you did that. So my advice about success is pretty simple around those lines. Nothing, nothing, nothing beats being kind and being loving. And also inquiring of little children because I realized late in life that, my God, we can learn so much from children, six, eight, 10, 12, 15 years old. 
So be open to little kids. I, I think I kind of digressed a little bit. What was your question again? I think, I think you answered it beautifully. <laughs> which, is, which is, I hear what keeps coming up. Yeah, yeah. my idea of success is a little different than you guys. <laughs> it's peace and kindness and love. <laughs> I, I think we're talking about guiding values. That seems to be a lot of what this conversation keeps coming back to throughout our life experiences whether personally or as we're watching our children or grandchildren, it's about what actually comes to the surface of what we want to value as a principle in life. Um, so our final question, um, and I'm going to direct this first to our youngest member of the panel, Sanria. Um, can you describe a time in your life in which there was a generational clash in approaching success between you and the older generation, your parents or caregivers? How did you navigate that conflict? And what advice do you have for others trying to navigate intergenerational clashes about living a successful life? Hello? Hello? Okay. Thank you. So, first of all, like having Indian parents, I am so thankful that I'm able to sing as much as I do. Because the stereotypical thing, like what I hear from my friends, is that study, study, study. Like, don't like waste your time singing or something. So first of all, I'm so thankful that I had so many opportunities and that my parents took me to all these events, found me events to sing. But I think that's a lot because my dad is a professional singer. But he sings like Hindi songs, obviously, and that too from like the 50s and 60s. Like 